Now, the term conservative and uh, obviously the uh, people who identify as Christians, uh, they're uh, philosophically, they can be quite different. I mean, for example, there's the conservatives and Christians who believe in uh, natural rights, uh, free markets and individual liberty, which uh, I, fair to say that you're more an adherent of? Yeah, look, I, I align very closely to a lot of libertarian thought um, with uh, a biblical foundation. Um, so where libertarianism or the Bible or traditional understanding of the Bible uh, might appear at odds, um, I'd basically need logical evidence-based persuasion that the Bible was wrong. Um, my experience is that in each of those circumstances, um, I can explain why, why the, the challenger to traditional um, Christian values is wrong. Um, and we still may not agree at the end of that, but, you know, I had a, a conversation with Peter Beatty at the end of um, uh, Meet the Candidate Forum when he was the candidate in my electorate, um, last election or the one before. And, uh, you know, he interpreted the Bible differently to me. I said, no problem, let's talk intellectually. And challenging the logical consequences of, of what he was arguing, um, he had to admit that, he had little more than his opinion on on what he was arguing for. And I'm like, well, that's not enough evidence for for me to vote for a policy, let alone abandon fundamental Bible teaching. I mean, your opinion is not an argument, um, and your arguments aren't holding any water. So, um, so look, the diversity of of uh, I guess, perspectives and opinions um, on theology and, and what the Bible teaches, I, I don't see them as a problem. Um, you know, there are some people who are clearly viewing the Bible as a temporary, circumstantial, subjective text instead of a, a true and foundational um, moral guide through which to view the rest of, of reality. But I think the diversity in Christianity is generally a beautiful thing. Um, you know, unity isn't lost without uniformity. Um, you know, on the on the right of politics and libertarianism, you know, we we don't all have to have the same approach and the same perspective on absolutely every policy uh, to have unity. You know, we're all agreed we want smaller government, more freedom. Uh, now there's there's not uniformity in what that looks like in everything, but we do have this unity that let's make the government smaller, let's make taxes smaller, let's make personal and and all other freedoms as great as possible without impacting on anybody else's property or, or person. Uh, well, I like uh, Christian conservatives uh, such as yourself because you... Uh, to, to me, like especially on the free market, it spells pretty much uh, libertarian views. That's why you know I've, I I quite like you know Corbynati and Australian conservatives because reading their their policies, mm. it's pretty much a you know libertarian platform. But the reason why I wanted to raise mm. this question is uh, when I went over to New Zealand, I interviewed a candidate from the Conservative Party of New Zealand, and there. Uh, interpretation of you know conservative and Christian values was very different. They they believed that it was you know their their role to use government to mould society you know in their image, which to me that doesn't you know respect people's you know individual liberty, uh, freedom, uh, and and so that's where those are the type of you know Christians and conservatives uh, you know I you know have a problem with and and would oppose. Um, Mm. Well, what's your take on that? Right. Um, there, there are some differences that I have with particularly Australian trends in, in libertarianism. In, in America, there's a, a lot more Christian influence, for want of a better term, on libertarianism. In Australia, sometimes libertarianism looks a lot like libertinism, where you know, it's a, almost a, a blank check, do whatever you want kind of thing. Um, broadly speaking, I think we have to come back to the merits. Like, I'm not 
arguing against homosexual marriage because I think it's morally wrong and because the Bible says it's morally wrong. And I do think it's morally wrong and I do think the Bible says it's morally wrong. But that's not a good enough argument to win the argument. I think we should vote against redefining marriage because of the consequences to children and to freedom and to individuals. I mean, homosexual lobby statistics, not right-wing biased stuff, but statistics from the homosexual community themselves when they're lobbying for health funds is that they have an inherently worse health outcome than heterosexual relationships. For the government to signal that these are the same is irresponsible legislation. It's reckless. It's failing our duty of care on so many levels to say these things are equal when they're categorically not. So, you know, somebody might see that as an imposition of my morals on somebody else. Well, that would be a one-dimensional approach at the different reasons that I bring to, to that debate. And so, you know, I think it is faithfully libertarian to say we need to give people their freedom, but the government must do no harm. And if the government says that a child does not need its natural mother and father and that the compound right of marriage and founding a family is the same whether it's homosexual or heterosexual parents, I think that's harmful. <laughs> I think that's dangerous, let alone safe schools and all the consequences we've seen happen elsewhere. So for me, it's not a freedom issue. It's a responsibility issue. We we don't see no role for government. We see a limited role for government. But one of those roles is protecting people. And if we're not going to protect the most vulnerable citizens in our society, which are children, by saying, no, these relationships aren't equal, and wherever possible, we want to promote the ideal environment in which to raise a child, on average, that is the role of government. And you know, we're not saying make homosexuality illegal. We're saying uh, it's not the same. It's already freedom to do whatever you want, love whoever you want, and enjoy all of the property and other personal rights as individuals that any de facto couple have. But, but nevertheless, we can't all of a sudden. You know, I I agree with uh, Andrew Cooper's um, role. I, I'm nearly entirely persuaded that government should just get out of marriage altogether. That, that's the far better outcome. If there's, on this question, I say no, but if the next question was, should marriage be deregulated entirely and left to whatever institution wants to conduct marriages, fantastic, because that also removes the potential for, for all the, you know, protected class and protected attributes and, and prosecution of, you know, equality and discrimination above and beyond all other rights, such as freedom of conviction and political expression. Um, there are definitely people that I'm trying to come back to you, to what I think your question was, but there are definitely people that, um, you know, abuse the Bible in both directions as an appeal to authority uh, which they expect to impose on, on other people without a persuasive argument. Um, and look, as an appeal to authority, it's good for you and for anybody that agrees that the Bible is an authority in their lives. Um, but then you have to have that debate if you, if you disagree on that. And look, and that's also fine. Like uh, we said in the previous segment, you know, um, unity doesn't require uniformity. And so in Christianity, there's been 2,000 years of us building on our understanding. We don't have a perfect understanding of God or, or the Bible now, and, and we understand it heaps better than we did 100 years ago, 1,000 years ago, and you know, further back. Um, so those debates are actually healthy and helpful and help us get closer and closer to a, a fuller understanding of truth. And that's where we should have... Um, um, policy discussions going as well, is that let's just get closer to, let, let's allow that we might be wrong and argue it out. The other type mm. of uh, 
or should I say, you know, Christian school of thought that I wanted to raise with you is what's called the the Christian left. I'll try to be a bit more specific here. So, um, you know, the the politics yeah. of say, uh, you know, Father Rod Bauer, uh, Father, you know, Frank Frank Brennan, that you know, it's the you know role of you know Christians to engage in you know uh, social justice, uh, you know, look uh, 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 at. And obviously, you know, looking after vulnerable people voluntarily is, yeah. you know, a good thing. But obviously the Christian left, you know, want to think that, yeah. you know, these government programs are what uh, is needed. Uh, uh, what's your take on how that, how their approach to, um, to use the expression church and state is? Good, good question. There's a couple of things I want to um pick up on there probably 30 percent of christians it's an estimate i've got no quantification that's reliable or source document but as an estimate i'd say probably 30 percent of christianity would vote or believe in po support policies that are left of center um, which leaves 70 percent that are probably right of center now i give credit to the motives of those who would identify themselves as leftist christians that it's essentially bleeding heart syndrome. I don't give it credit for being right, but they're trying to care for people. So I give them that benefit of the doubt. Um, but as a righty, um, you know, conservative person, I think most bleeding hearts do more harm than good um, and end up killing people with kindness. Um, they're just very short-sighted thinking, not thinking through the long-term consequences of things. Um, so that's what I'll say about the leftists who are Christians. And, and again, the way to bring them to truth, um, not saying my side, but the way to bring each of us to truth is to, okay, if we're going to interpret Scripture differently, um, what are the facts, data, evidence and logic? So, you know, let's have a logical discussion about why generational welfare should be stopped. But some welfare is good. The reality is that... I believe welfare is the church's obligation. It's the Christian's obligation. It's the moral person's obligation. And welfare, you know, individual philanthropy and donations to charity and generosity was never higher than before the government took the responsibility away from us. When they took the responsibility away from us, they took the power away from us. And Christians just go, you want to do it? Then do it. And, and now we pay our taxes to the government and try and get a better government and try and help the poor through the government that way. But you know what? Let's go libertarian. Let's get rid of government aid programs. Let's get rid of these silly things and let's let the church do it again because the church was doing a fantastic job of it prior to the welfare age. You know, 100 years ago, individual donations were, you know, many times greater than they are today. Why has charity and generosity deprived? Because the government wants to do everything for us. And now there's no personal responsibility to love my neighbor because the government's loving my neighbor. I can just paint my house, mow my lawn, navel gaze for the rest of the day because there is no obligation to the nation beyond paying my taxes. Uh, we're legally obliged to do so. Um, the question of social justice. I've got a little bee in my bonnet about that word. Jesus never advocated social justice. Jesus never did social justice. What Jesus advocated was justice. Now, it doesn't take a Christian to love justice, but why does it need a modification? Social justice. Justice is justice. Anything less than justice needs more justice. So, you know, it, it's this, this false illusion that we're chasing that there is such a thing as social justice. I mean, people are always going to be poor, but we can minimise it and do our best. What we need to chase is that personal freedom, that small government, that that um, virtuous citizenship where, as individuals, we're encouraged to take responsibility for the need that we see. We've been there before, and it was the rise of big government that ended it. It wasn't, it wasn't the end of the church age or, or anything like that by any means. It was the rise of big government. So get uh, government smaller, and you will see more social justice. You'll actually see more justice. Just, you know, this... Uh, this fairy tale illusion of making sure that a gay couple can force a baker to make them a wedding cake against his religious convictions and, and personal, you know, objections, 
that's not social justice. That's oppression. That's totalitarianism. That's slavery, forcing somebody to perform an act for you that they, that they don't want to, to provide a service. You know, so that's, um, I guess that's the perspective that I would bring as a conservative libertarian to, as a Christian, to the whole you know, welfare and social justice argument is, guys, we, we actually need to do more, but the way we do more is by making government smaller, making government do less, and letting... I mean, people that call for church to, you know, not get tax concessions for the, the tithes and offerings that they get all the time forgets the fact that they're actually doing government... doing work that the government should do under the current theory of big government welfare, social justice crusades, um, to stop the church from participating in that or expect them to do it um, as a profitable enterprise, um, you know, paying tax like Amway or Toyota, uh, that's just ridiculous. The government doesn't pay tax on, on the government's work. Nobody else doing this uh, this welfare and infinite good. It, like, even if you resent it on a, on a personal level, it, it's just it's really not pragmatic. It's really not logical because the imposition, the cost to government of having to do all the work that churches do, all the good in the community that churches do, if the churches didn't do it, would cost the government and the taxpayer, and that means you, uh, far more than the tax concessions that churches receive. It's just, it's, it's really cynical, small-minded thinking. This has been an Unshackled Fast. Please like, comment and subscribe. While you're here, grab our free ebook at theunshackledbattlefield.net and visit theunshackled.net for all the latest news and commentary.